It turns out some alleged half-ape, half-human fossils may be the same species. More blood found in a fossil, a new rant, and we address fewer questions about the Bible and the age of the Earth. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, carried on the Miracle Channel in Canada, the Walk TV in the United States, and of course, the Chris Cinema Network on YouTube, ChrisCinema.com, Kristen Cinema at its finest. Excellence of Pirate Broadcasting, we continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our Creator while doing it. God did not say, be ye transformed by the removal of your mind. Rather, we here at Genesis Week believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain for a reason. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. I was flooded with two reports from all of you intrepid reporters worldwide. Thanks again, I'd rather get a report 100 times than to miss an important story. And these two were both big ones. The first one involves a paper that came out in Science Magazine this past week regarding some fossil skulls found in the Georgia Republic. Now it's interesting this story came out because the past few episodes of Genesis Week we have been discussing the incredible variation we can see in animals like dogs and birds and also humans. We'd also been answering a viewer question about the supposed half-ape, half-human fossils called hominids that had been you know, claimed over the years. Now if you'll recall, I had emphasized several points regarding the hominid fossils. Incredible variation among the apes incredible variation among humans and the extremely sparse fossil sample groups we have with which to judge. Now this of course is ignoring all of the fossils that have been found that are completely modern human fossils, but they were in the wrong place according to evolutionism and thus are ignored by the anti-theist community and even most evolutionists. Now, a recent paper had come out discussing the many Cetacosaurus fossils that had been found, which all turned out to be one species. So, as we get more human hominid fossils, it should come as no surprise then that similar conclusions would be attained with regards to the fossils of our alleged ancestors. And so, the most recent paper in Science Magazine apparently does just that what has been described as one of the biggest collections of well-preserved early human remains from the Dominici region in the Georgian Republic. With this many well-preserved fossils now, the researchers are suggesting that Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus may in fact be all the same species, just with variation. Now there is controversy and a lot of cogitation going on among the evolutionary community though. Uh, many flat out denying the conclusions of the paper, while others acknowledging a very powerful case has been built, but still remaining skeptical. What this is showing us is the controversy even among the evolutionists about the alleged rock solid evidence for human evolution. We have very little fact and a whole mess of interpretation. And it's this interpretation which is presented as fact to the general public to convince them of the evolution myth. Now, as you can see here, the interpretation isn't solid even among the evolutionists themselves. So how can it be given as fact in support of evolution? The second story involved the finding of a blood engorged fossil mosquito from a shale bed in Glacier National Park in Montana. At the very least, some of the heme molecules from the blood may have been preserved in the fossil, and quite possibly the blood itself. Now, some might be getting excited having visions of Jurassic Park where they extracted dinosaur blood from a mosquito to make clones. 
Well, as we have already shown multiple times on Genesis Week, we actually have dinosaur blood. In fact, dinosaur blood has been found many times in the most recent report coming out earlier this year. This mosquito has been given the conventional age of some 46 million years old. The researchers made some frankly wild speculation as to how on earth this mosquito was preserved. The preservation of fossil female mosquito USNM 559050 was an extremely improbable event. The insect had to take a blood meal, be blown to the water's surface, and sink to the bottom of a pond or similar lacustrine structure to be quickly embedded in fine anaerobic sediment, all without the disruption of its fragile, distended, blood-filled abdomen. Extremely improbable indeed. It's obvious that this mosquito had to be buried quickly, not slowly. There was no chance for rotting at all. And as we've seen in other shales, contrary to conventional thinking, shales were laid down quickly, sometimes even with polystrate fossils going through them. Now besides the homage paid to slow geologic processes, what about the time frame? Did the researchers stop to question the age of the fossil? After all, could we really expect that even heme molecules might be preserved for 46 million years? This fossil has provided a unique opportunity to ask whether or not a portion of the hemoglobin molecule could be preserved after tens of millions of years. Heme was the most obvious target for our analysis. Detection of heme-derived porphyrins in the female specimen confirms that it is indeed a blood-engorged mosquito and provides direct evidence of hematophagy in the fossil record. The short answer is that the researchers question whether or not heme could actually stick around for 46 million years. Instead of questioning whether or not the fossil was actually 46 million years old, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who gained fame and a few enemies after publishing her findings of blood and dinosaur bones, had also commented in passing that the find affirms that heme can stick around for many tens of millions of years. Dr. Theodore Syke has published an impressive number of papers, including some focused on the deterioration of biological materials over time. He wrote in, I'm looking at the chemical structure of heme, hemoglobin, to heme, to biliverdin, to bilirubin, etc. And I see 13 double bonds, four nitrogens susceptible to oxidation, and two carboxylic acid groups. This means heme is highly susceptible to hydrolysis, oxidation, and other degrading chemical reactions. Mary Schweitzer is wrong about heme being the type of molecule able to survive millions of years. 5,000 years is a more reasonable limit. Heme was barely identifiable in the Shroud of Turin, which maybe goes to 1200 AD or to 33 AD if you believe that is when the shroud originated. In other words, all of these findings of blood and fossils, going literally back to the 1930s, does not suggest that blood can stick around for tens of millions of years, but rather the fossils themselves are not tens of millions of years old. This most recent finding only lends support to a world that is only thousands of years old, not millions. A report in Science Magazine discusses more of the genetic differences between chimps and humans. DNA is first converted into messenger RNA, which is then used to build proteins. The messenger RNA, which is called mRNA, is regulated by various genetic processes. Now, because it was assumed that chimps and humans were the closest evolutionary relatives, and that chimps and humans have almost identical DNA, the different methods of regulating mRNA between the two was thought to affirm evolution and natural selection. Well, as it turns out, the different regulating methods have very little difference on how the mRNA was used. Now, I bring up this paper to highlight a common misconception about the genetic similarities between humans and chimps, as is seen even in this technical paper. Now we here at Genesis Week answer your questions and question your answers. And we're questioning the answers here caused by a question that was never asked. Are humans and chimps really that similar genetically? In the Science Daily report on this paper, you can see the assumptions. 
Changes in gene regulation have been used to study the evolutionary chasm that exists between humans and chimpanzees despite their largely identical DNA. Largely identical DNA? This claim is actually a myth, and an old one at that. Let's review the matter in Crevo Rant number 181. You've probably heard it said that chimps and humans have almost identical DNA. In fact, the number most people have heard is that chimps and humans are 98.4% genetically identical. Surely we evolved from a common ape ancestor. The 98% myth has been running around for decades, being used to sway honest people into believing the evolutionism myth. It blows me away that anti-creationists would use this argument, as even a junior high school student can refute it. Anybody can look up things on the internet and see for themselves the various lengths of genomes of organisms. Now, if you do this, you'll notice that the chimpanzee DNA is 12% longer than the human DNA. Wait a minute, 12% longer, but it's 98.4% identical? Does anybody else detect a math error here? But let's give them their 98.4% identical for a second. What does that mean? Let's give evolution the advantage and use the smaller of the two genomes the human genome, which is a measly 3.2 billion base pairs long. 98.4% identical means it's 1.6% difference. Well, 1.6% of 3.2 billion is 51,200,000. This is how many changes there are between chimps and humans. As little as one change in the wrong place in your DNA is lethal. How, pray tell, do you expect to make tens of millions of changes without killing the organism? Short answer is, you can't. But let's assume that we are 98% identical to the chimp. So what? The differences between apes and humans are far, far beyond the physical and genetic. When was the last time you saw a chimpanzee doing calculus? Building and working on machines. <laughs> Creating artwork. Making and playing musical instruments. This is all just as silly as a chimpanzee talking about technical genetics. Furthermore, it turns out the 98% myth got its start in the mid-1970s, long before actual DNA comparison could be made. This 98% figure was arrived at using a technique as known as reassociation kinetics. Basically, they'd take a strand of DNA, split it down the middle into RNA strands then mix these strands between humans and chimps and time how quickly or slowly the human and chimp strands joined together. The faster they joined, the more identical the strands were assumed to be. We now know this method is hugely unreliable, but yet the 98% figure now stuck, becoming a sort of gold standard to which all future studies tried to align. Today, after actual sequencing the human and chimpanzee DNA into their string of letters of A, T, C, and G, we can now do a letter-by-letter -letter comparison to see just how identical chimps and humans really are. And we've already shown how it's mathematically impossible to arrive at 98% identical, yet many studies allegedly come to this figure anyway. So how did they come up with this number? Well, the researchers start by removing huge portions of the DNA. Usually more than 98% of the DNA is ignored, and they focus on only the portions of the DNA that provide the code for building proteins. Of that less than 2%, they then very carefully select portions, 
For example, they will pick a gene that they know both chimps and humans have. Amazing! The single genes are almost identical. Well, no guff. The transmission of my 1986 chick magnet is the same transmission that was in the General Lee. This is because the chick magnet and the General Lee both had a common designer, Nodge Motor Vehicle Company. In like fashion, identical or near identical genes in two organisms can be because of a common designer, not necessarily a common ancestor. But it gets even more scandalous when you dig into the technical details of the DNA comparisons. Let's lay out a chimp DNA and a human DNA strand beside each other. Well, first off, you only have four letters to choose from. That means you automatically have a 25% match. So suddenly, 98% isn't anywhere near as impressive, as even the evolutionists have alleged that you are at least 50% genetically identical to the banana. Even comparing the same genes, or different portions of the DNA, laying out the two strands side by side, the researchers will notice gaps in the alignments. Because evolution is assumed, then it is assumed that these gaps are insertions of information into, or deletions of information from, the DNA. They call these indels for short, short for insertions and deletions. These indels are ignored in the studies, basically removed. So the only differences documented are the actual letters which are different. These indels might only be one or two letters long, or they could be tens of thousands of letters long. That's right! To allege a match between two strands of DNA, the researchers could remove completely huge chunks of DNA containing thousands of letters and they don't count that as a difference between the two strands. Then there's the issue of orphan genes. These are genes that are only found in one specific organism. Chimpanzees have hundreds of them. Humans have hundreds of them. These orphan genes represent a 0% match between humans and chimps. These orphan genes are also ignored when comparing chimps and humans. Well, given all this latitude for what to include and exclude, it's not difficult to see how one can arrive at the mathematically impossible figure of 98% genetical genetic similarity between chimps and humans. Given the same freedoms, I'm quite certain that you could also arrive at the conclusion that humans are 98% identical to the banana. <laughs> when one actually takes into account all of the DNA, the figure of matching chimp-human DNA rapidly drops down to as low as 70% depending on how you do your comparisons. Remembering that the zero point on our scale starts at 25%, not zero, you can start to grasp the difference. The differences between humans and chimps are great indeed, and the differences do not support common ancestry. <laughs> the 98% myth is a downright scandalous myth. Don't let it make a monkey out of you. Chimps and humans are radically different of which we are told in Genesis that only mankind was created in God's image. God didn't come in chimpanzee form to die for the chimpanzees. He came in human form to die in place of sinful humans like myself and you. He died in our place, then rose from the dead to show us he was the way to eternal life. That same person said that in order to obtain eternal life, you must be born again. Now if he rose from the dead, then he obviously knows something we don't. I'd pay close attention to what he said and heed his warnings. Being born again is simply believing that Jesus rose from the dead, acknowledging that you've sinned, and asking him for forgiveness, and he will give you eternal life. Why don't you do that today? The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12 DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, Geology, Physics, Paleontology, and Archaeology. 
Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources, such as question and answer sheets and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. Order your set today online at Ian's Bookstore. Woohoo! Mail for me! YouTuber Keys DeVries wrote in on episode 6. Quote, may I remind you all that evolutionism must also start with incest because when the first human arose there would have only been one couple. End quote. Really dubious, that what evolution says? Or does it say that evolution occurs through isolated populations of animals, organisms? Have you done your homework? Because if you were in my class, I'd give you an F. What you're ranting about doesn't make sense. This Adam and Eve were genetically pure is something you sucked out of your thumb. Well, thank you for saying exactly what I said the evolutionists would say just last week. <laughs> you took a quantum leap without even realizing it. Evolution does not happen to populations. It happens first to an individual, which then reproduces to become a population. As for the first humans being genetically pure, well, that is what the facts show. Genetic entropy. We are degrading genetically. And that's an established, observed fact. Therefore, it is a logical conclusion that our ancestors were genetically superior to us. I go over this in detail in Crevo Rant number 78, Genetic Entropy. YouTuber Don Daly wrote in, Ian, why not use the term microdevolution instead? It is certainly more accurate, less confusing, and gets the point across better. Keep up the good work. Nuevo Teoria de la Creation wrote in, asking about the interpretation of day in Genesis and its application to the age of the earth. He also commented that he agreed with the views of Pat Robertson on the 700 Club. Now, Nueva's blog is in Spanish, but he kindly provided some English translations of his posters. Now, first of all, with regards to Pat Robertson's views on the dinosaurs and the age of the earth, I actually addressed that particular program the following week. Uh, in Genesis Week, Episode 13, Dinosaurs in the Bible, I showed why Mr. Robertson was just plain wrong that he was just plain unaware of the evidence, and that his theology was all wrong with regards to the dinosaurs. Now, I, I won't repeat what I said there, here, now. Uh, however, Nueva did ask a common question regarding the interpretation of the word day, and pointed to verses in 2 Peter and the Psalms, suggesting that the days in Genesis were not literal days. Now, in 2 Peter, we read that a day to the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years to the Lord is like a day. And in Psalms 90 verse 4, it essentially reiterates the same analogy. So Nueva did some math and the number of days according to the history of the Bible to come up with an age of the universe of 13.14 billion years, quite close to the conventional age of 13.7 billion years old. Now, there are several problems I'll respectfully point out here. First of all, notice that the verse in 2 Peter can go either way. A day can be a really long time, or a really long time can be short like a day. So why did you choose to go with a day being really long, rather than really short? You see, secondly, this presents a math problem. As we read in Genesis that Adam was created on day 6, lived through day 7, and in Genesis 5.5 5, we find out that he died 930 years old. Now, if the days of creation were, say, 1,000-year-long days, and not literal 24-hour days, then obviously Adam would have had to have been at least 2,000 years old. If the days of Genesis were even longer, as, as you're suggesting, then the problem is exacerbated even more. Also, you attempted to line this with the age of the universe arrived at by people who are claiming that the, Earth, the universe is 3.7 billion literal years old. Now, this was not a figurative number to them. So, to apply your methodology to the days of creation would multiply the math problems in the Bible even more, and literally, not figuratively. Lastly, when you actually examine how such people arrived at an age of the universe as 13.7 billion years old, 
you find out quite quickly that their model contradicts itself. The very reasons they claim the universe is old, uh, such as distant starlight, is the very reason their model cannot work. For example, if distant starlight takes billions of years to get here, then they have the problem of the even distribution of energy around the universe. That energy cannot travel faster than the speed of light, but at that speed it would take substantially more than 13.7 billion years to evenly spread around the universe. See, the old age model contradicts itself. Furthermore, Nueva suggested replacing the word day in Genesis creation account with the word light. Now, first of all, but I see no justification for this whatsoever. But secondly, when we look at the use of the word day elsewhere in scripture, we can tell when the word is literal and figurative. Now, yes, the Bible does use the word day in a figurative sense elsewhere in the Bible, but in all seven days of creation, the word day is associated with morning and evening, light and darkness, and a number. So it is obvious then that these are literal days. And if you attempt to replace the word day with light, then you have a problem because all seven days of creation are also associated with light and darkness and daytime and nighttime. So how can they be the first light, second light, third light, and not be a morning and evening or a daytime and nighttime? So, as you can see, there are huge problems the moment you try and change out the words or try to reinterpret Genesis. And that's just the math and hermeneutical problems. You also have huge issues with the foundations of deep time and evolution. Evolution and deep time thrive upon billions of years of death and disease. Yet the scriptures clearly show that death was a result of man's sin. So, you have the problem of death before the sin of Adam and Eve in the Bible, if evolution and deep time were true. So I go into more details in part seven of my complete creation video series. Thanks for writing in these excellent questions, Nueva. And thank you for watching. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for this week. I hope you join us again next week. You can send in your comments, questions, banking information, and mother's maiden name to us in a number of ways. Remember those words of warning and comfort from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.